tool. And great. So you guys can see that hopefully. And oh, let's make this go down a little bit. Uh, and I will share my screen. Can you start with introductions? Yes. Yeah. Why don't you guys you guys start introductions? Maybe you guys can come over to the camera to do to do your your introductions. Hi, Kendall. Hi, everybody in the room. Um, I'm Claire Steele, and I'm an associate professor in ESRM and um, part of the faculty team that uh, led this service learning opportunity. Um, I've been involved with this particular service learning for about six or seven years. So this is the third one of these trips that I've done. So. Hey, Kendall. Cindy, Cindy Wiles, I'm in mathematics, so this picture, I'm going to put in a plug that we've missed time, it's not ESRN, it's everybody. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but and English, and English. And English, and, and students are from psych and anthro and everything else as well, lots from ESRN and bio for sure. Um, but yes, yeah, so I've been doing the whale trip and taking students there and watching it change their lives for nine nine or 10 years-ish. Um, and then of course, this trip was radically different from what we've been doing in the past, as you'll hear. Yeah. Oh, uh, hey, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, Sean Anderson from ESRM, and uh, and I've been doing uh, these types of disaster trips for about twenty years. But this is the first one we've done in Hawaii, and so I was the along with Claire, I was the ESRM faculty, and then uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Stacy Anderson, who will be. Oh, she is here. D Daisy, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Stacey Anderson. I'm double booked this morning, but I'm chair of English and I'm one of the faculty um, that uh, helped with the trip. Okay, and while we're on live, why don't we go to Kendall? Do you want to introduce yourself, Kendall? Hello, everyone. I'm Kendall. I'm lecturer faculty in English for 10 years, and I'm doing the Community Engagement Fellowship this year. Awesome. awesome. And then maybe folks in the room could just... Uh... You guys, you don't have to tell me, but you guys should raise your hand and 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 wave and introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Carissa. I'm one of the students. I come from the Anthro program, but I love the ESRM. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Max. I'm a biology major, an major, with minor in ESRM, and I'm one of the I'm Rob. Uh, Robert spent the site major. I also was on a trip as well. Oh, cool. English minor, excellent. Hi, I'm Cassandra, ESRM major as well, and I'm minoring biology. Cool. Hello, everyone. My name is Asadul Asadi, and I'm a third year uh, assistant professor in the School of Education. And today I'm feeling like some of my students sitting all the way in the back. <laughs> <laughs> excellent. I'm a distance professor in Spanish. Regina is my faculty director from the with me engagement. Um, and I also teach in the English program. So, you want to be an English right now? So, we're <laughs> 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 really excited to hear from you and all your experience. I'm really excited to have you on this morning. I can't wait to hear all of that. Awesome. So um, uh, the first thing to say is if you guys, so we have some students here and they'll be definitely providing their, their feedback, but um, we really want to make sure that everybody knows that uh, April 11th is our, our uh, true celebration of the class where we'll have our students and, and art and, and, and posters and stuff like that. So we hope you all can uh, attend on the afternoon of April 11th. Um, and so today is really about um, just discussing more of the logistics. So today is really more for folks that are perhaps interested in doing uh, or organizing or, or planning a course um, like this, um, you know, lessons learned. So what what kind of administratively worked, what didn't work, how, how did the preparation go, did it not go, that kind of stuff. So that's really the theme um, of today. So we're not so much going to be talking exactly about about um, the disaster itself or, or what have you. It's more like how we approach this that you all might be able to adapt to, to your uh, ideas or your contexts as we go forward. Um, and so the first thing to say before we advance on here is that um, 
uh, we had a lot of support, right? So every, just about everybody in the room was was part of this or, or online was part of this. And um, it starts with getting the money. And so we just wanted to be really explicit and say that IRA, uh, our, our, our instructionally related activities fund is the core funding for this. And we also had some additional fund um, from the Maxwell uh, Hanrahan Foundation that allowed us to take the number of students that we were able to, to uh, take for this engagement. And then all kinds of in-kind support from, from English and from ESRM and from uh, arts and sciences and, and math and all over the place. Um, so, uh, so we just wanna acknowledge that this, this took a village to make this go. Um, and that can seem daunting, but it's totally possible if you all have, uh, have the passion and the interest. And so I'm just gonna lead us off and then turn it over to, to Claire. Uh, oh, sorry, no, this control is what I'm supposed to be doing, no? This control is what we doing? Yeah, that one. Okay. So um, basically, what we did. So, so the 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 primary um, on the ground activity was in January. So winter break for us. And so uh, for folks that no, so one quick step back. So IRA um, is a main source for a lot of these cool things that we've been doing for several years. It's the main source of our international uh, undergraduate uh, international based travel experiences, all that great stuff, bringing uh, jazz musicians and performers to campus, et cetera. The idea with IRA is it's never supposed to be core instruction. So this is supposed to be additional stuff, stuff that would be cool and make your uh, students learning better, but it, it's it's not supposed to be um, you know quote unquote relied upon, and so as a consequence of that, um, for these uh, while you can use IRA funding to go to the islands or whatever for these larger trips, so these multi day trips, um, the one of the key requirements is, is that they not be during regular school sessions. So these trips have to either be winter break, spring break, or summer. And so in our case, we um, opted to go during winter break. And that's, uh, as Claire will explain, that's uh, partly because of the ecology of the area. That's when the whales are there. It wouldn't make sense to go in the summer, for example. And, um, and so we went uh, essentially just after New Year's. Uh, we went for the students were there for 10 days. We went, some of the, some of the uh, instructors and support staff went a couple days early, stayed a couple days late to deal with logistics. So so the trip was about a two week trip, although the students were there for 10 days, um, 11 days. Um, and so uh, we had a diverse group of folks. Another key thing when you're thinking of planning this, the tension now is always, hey, can you do this cheaper? Hey, can you do this cheaper? Hey, can you do this cheaper? And it's very tempting to, to do that. And in some cases you need to, but uh, having this, this might look like an excessive number of faculty and support staff. I will tell you, it is not even close to excessive, right? I mean, we needed all of this support to make, to create the experience and, and to do the service we were uh, doing, um, including the number of students. Having this large number of students allowed us to do things we would not, we just foundationally would not have been able to do if we'd only had six or 12 or you know a smaller number of students. Um, and in addition to having a diverse, uh, a larger number of folks, which gives us capacity, having the disciplinary diversity was also really, really great. So um, faculty diversity, student background diversity, um, ages of students, interests of students, all those things really um, play into the success of a project like this. Um, the core, as as uh, Claire and Cindy will tell you, is 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 on the back of a long term project that um, are on the um, emeritus professor uh, from CSUCI, Dr. Rachel Cartwright, uh, start, started a nonprofit in the 90s, and then starting in the early 2000s, uh, we started bringing, uh, or mid 2000s, whatever, the aughts, um, started bringing uh, CSUCI classes to Maui to help with um, whale research, humpback whale research, which we'll, we'll uh, describe, but basically that uses boats. That means students going out on vessels, going to the Maui Channel, and taking direct observations or, or using drones to take direct observations. Um, we'll go over that. And then what's been layered on for this experience was uh, the issue of the disaster, right? And, and how we work on recovery. So, so we were able to continue that historic activity, that, that, that historic longitudinal monitoring and, and assist with that, um, which most recently has had data from our from that our students collected over the years, which is featured in a couple of big papers that came out a couple a couple weeks ago. Um, uh, peer-reviewed, you know, basic research stuff. Um, 
we layered on the recovery which to the fires, which happened in August of uh, the fires across much of Maui, not just Lahaina, but Lahaina was the base of operations for the whale research. And so, so at first we weren't even sure if we could even do this, right? It was unclear like who was hurt, infrastructure wise, can we even physically get there, that kind of stuff. Um, and so what we layered on was um, both onto the existing historic humpback research, we layered on um, environmental monitoring and then a huge amount of volunteering with a diverse uh, number of partners across uh, West Maui. Um, all the stuff that we talk about in general service learning issues, a more, perhaps a more conventional experience or more uh, a less uh, heavy lift experience you might do in any of your classes, um, we still apply all those things. And so, for example, um, on the upper right here, this is um, a group of students getting ready to work on a farm um, that is a, a, trying to reestablish traditional Hawaiian practices. Um, and, and this is a, a blessing that we're doing around a tarot field and sort of an orientation before we got going. On the left, uh, we did a, a lot of work with local schools who were displaced because of the fire, either physically, either the schools were destroyed and the kids were displaced and they couldn't go to school there or the capacity of the schools changed. And so they were shifted to another uh, a public school. And so we did um, ran some science modules for them and are now working on some long term collaboration project based learning with those various school uh, kids from second grade to eighth grade. Um, on the lower left is with the Hawaiian Council in a former Safeway, which is now a distribution center. So the students did a lot of, of distribution of direct aid. And then, of course, on the lower right, um, the more traditional work out on the water with the whales. Woo -hoo, woo -hoo, woo -hoo. And um, and so with that, I'm going to turn it over, I think, to Claire next to talk about our timeline. Sure. OK, so uh, thanks, Sean. Uh, so this project, uh, there's a long sort of timeline in advance of and after the actual trip. Uh, so that started with uh, reapplication for our IRA funding. So the, the three iterations of this trip that I've been involved in happened in 2019. And then uh, 2022, um, which was, you know, during, it was like basically pandemic situation, like at the height of the Omicron. We were um, the first the school group allowed to go anywhere. Yeah. So it was very, like up until the week before, we're like signed the form to go to black place. Yeah. yeah. So that's all great. But just for our speakers, if you guys could stand a little bit closer to the speakers, I'll go. Thank you. Um, and so for this third iteration, this is about two years after we had gone previously. Um, so I applied in February, 2023, um, originally asked for $56,000, which would be two thirds of the cost, the other one third being made up by um, student fees. We were asked if we could do it for less. And so I said, well, we could do it for $50,000 if we kind of skinnied it down a little bit. Uh, and so that's actually what we got for funding. We were awarded funding in June. And we had our first planning meeting, you know, after the initial woohoo, we got the funding uh, in uh, in July. And so that was really a meeting with um, uh, our partners, the Kiki Kahola Project and Dr. Rachel Cartwright um, and the faculty that were involved. Um, and then the fires happened, you know, uh, August 8th. So not quite, you know, a little bit more than a week later. And so there was an initial kind of big shock and then grief and and really just like we we were sort of standing standing aside and, and wondering could we even make this project happen the the town of Lahaina was destroyed um people that worked with Kiki Kahola project lost all of their homes uh the harbor was destroyed and the condos that we used to stay at were destroyed so it really seemed like there's there's no like foundation and there's all of this like you know, human grief that has happened around the loss of life and the loss of, you know, property and infrastructure and everything around the harbor. So we really were kind of standing, um, as standing by just sort of offering support to the people that we knew in, in West Maui. Um, and, and, you know, there was some fundraising and things like that, but, but really we weren't sure if this is going to proceed. So we sort of kept checking in with people that we were working with um, and then, uh, can you go back to the timeline? Um, I think we sort of started having sort of weekly check-ins um, with the faculty and our partners there. Um, and then it sort of began to evolve, like, well, maybe we can do this if we use 
a boat ramp in a, t a different town. And, and, you know, once we found out that the boats had survived or maybe we can do this, you know, in kind of a small way to, to keep things going. Um, and, and I, th I can't, can't really remember what made us feel confident that we could do it other than like the, 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 the general feeling of our partners. And we said, I think of, I was like, we could do this. <laughs> we sort of, you know, progressively became more confident that, that we could make it happen um, but more than that, that we could offer something to this community in West Maui that has been, you know, welcoming our students for the last 15 years and supporting our partners in their research out there. Um, so we felt like we could do something community oriented, even if the research didn't happen, that we could bring people there um, and we could offer just willing hands and bodies to, to help out. So we had weekly, um, weekly check-in meetings. Um, as we began to plan this, and there's a lot of upfront logistical stuff, which is securing housing and securing, you know, boats and boat insurance and flights and uh, inviting student applications and, and assessing students and then deciding on the team. And then <clears throat> once we decided on the team during the fall semester, we uh, plan to have three preparatory sessions with the students. So the way the class is set up, it's a spring class, but the trip happens in the winter. And as Sean said, that that's partly logistical uh, a lot of it has to do with when the whales will be there Dr. Cartwright used to run trips in spring break uh, but now that would be too late because of climate change and other things that the whales start to arrive a little earlier so we had three uh, prep sessions which were sort of you know half half days with our students ahead of time which was really important for team building I think that really helped with the on the ground cohesion because once you're there like it's just go 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 um, then we had, uh, uh, we were able to secure additional funding from the Maxwell Hammerhand Foundation in September, and the Maui trip then happened, which we'll talk more details about, um, in early January, basically right before school starts. And then um, we have a weekly meeting with students as we are working through our data and preparing um, these products that we're going to have for our celebration of service on um, April 11th. Okay, I can I say something yep. about the time. So, um, for these things, it's always better to go early, to to plan as early as possible. The constraint often for us here at CSCCI is the funding cycle is usually not aligned with um, and some of my previous schools. If we were doing this, we would have started like you know a year and a half earlier or something like that. Um, there are additional thing additional constraints if if the, you were interested in doing this in an international context. Those are evolving. Um, but essentially, because of liability and insurance, those discussions just have to be much more uh, 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 take place much earlier so that things can be approved because international travel requires presidential level approval and or depending on where you're going, sometimes system level approval. So I'll just say that. And then um, the other thing is, as Claire is right, the, the getting the extra, we realized very early on that we couldn't do what what we would want to do in terms of service unless we had more bodies, more physical capacity to do stuff. And so securing that extra funding from that outside partner was really, really key. And then the other one I just say is, uh, uh, I think sometimes we get a little bit into our, um, our own minds about this kind of stuff. These are human beings that are screwed over, right? That have been historically screwed over, that are being screwed over by disaster and climate change and stuff. And they are, they are, they all feel every single place we've ever worked, they all feel ignored and abandoned. Not in the first day or two when all the love is coming and the reporters are there and all the donations are starting to flow in, but a month, two, three, four, five, six months later, that's really when people start to get depressed and the adrenaline runs out. And that was the time period we were talking about going. And so even though there was uncertainty about like you know the timeline. It was very, very clear that that um, uh, any help at all would be desperately needed, but especially then, especially after it's not sexy anymore, especially after it's not popular, especially after it's not not in everybody's on the tip of everybody's tongue, and that uh, really makes a huge difference to this for the students' experiences too. When we show up as as you know and just say, "Hey, what do you need?" So so that that plays in the timeline as well. Yeah, and we really had to sort of embrace the uncertainty of it because. Whereas in the past, and both Cindy and I like to have things very organized ahead of time. We knew, you know, we're going to have the boat for this many days and we're going to be doing this research on, on this type of days. Uh, this was really just like a kind of a leap of faith about embracing the uncertainty of like, 
what is going to happen? Like, we're, it's going to be six months out from this big disaster. You know, how are we going to make all of these kind of uncertainties work together? Are you taking over for me? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so, so and really we're presenting here for, for two reasons. One is to share lessons learned about logistics, but the other one is exactly about what Sean was saying about these human beings. And and go ahead and do this. So this is the pre-fire. I'm oh, sorry, this is pre, pre, this pre, pre, pre. Let me show you something. This is where we've stayed the last several scripts in this condo here. And I can tell you how we walked through here and then came out here. You uh, use the bathroom right here before you get on the boat because there's no bathrooms on the boat, but that's kind of cool. Uh -huh. um, and so like we knew this whole area. Here's the harbor. It's all very personal and stuff like that. Next slide shows it's it's gone. I mean, it's just completely gone. This was our base, boats were burned. And I was looking at this during and after the fires and feeling kind of devastated. But the people there that lost homes, that lost loved ones, that lost employment, that, that are going to be, they're going to, you know, some people, most of them will never recover financially. And whether they recover emotionally depends on a whole bunch of factors. And so we wanted to be very, very careful. Cindy, come closer. Keep going, keep going. Come closer. Yeah. Yeah. So we wanted to be very careful about preparing ourselves and our students. We've always needed to be careful because it's another culture. It's a culture that's been greatly impacted by tourism and by white colonialism and everything else like that. And we want to take our students and have them understand these things. We need to better educate ourselves, of course. Um, but then so, so we've always worried about being culturally appropriate, providing that understanding, providing that learning in just those three prep days and whatever time we had before, but then ongoing learning during and after. So I'm going to talk about some of that kind of that thinking about our social positions, thinking about um, being culturally um, sensitive and, and learning in that way. So if you go forward. Oh, so even, even from the start, I think I took over to it. That's okay, that's all right. all right. Even from the start, we're setting expectations, which is part of that, you know, here's what you're getting into, here's what we expect from you, sign up if you're willing to do that. And so we, you know, we're saying, okay, expect preparation learning assignments, but what's needed if you can't see that that far away? Great attitudes, a spirit of paying it forward, and flexibility. So we're messaging like we don't know exactly what's going to happen. And the next two slides are kind of the questions we used on the applications. But can I, I say one aspect about flexibility is that oftentimes people want to know what we're doing every single day at like 8 a.m. and 9 a.m. That is a recipe for badness. We know, we, we have an outline, but in on these types of trips where I have done that, things always change things always evolve and then it starts to become about what we're not doing or we have a disappointment and how come we didn't do x and so we definitely and the students can chime in here but we definitely like told people what we're doing and hey tomorrow we're doing next one but um but we really really emphasize we need to be flexible we need to be flexible because we're we're one we don't know how it's going to evolve but two our community partners might ask us for something we'd not even thought about and we want to have that flexibility to serve them as they as they need. So the flexibility is key. I think that actually goes across all of this. I think it, I think it does, but I, I think, you know, making sure that people understand that before they're in it is important and really, really kind of, you know, we don't know exactly what we'll be doing, but understanding kind of the scope and, and the, and how it's, how things will feel at times. So we try to do that. And I'm not going to spend very long on many of these slides, but in the, in those student applications, we're asking about your experience working on a team, your experience living and working in close quarters and in challenging environments. Um, this is actually, let me just say, where some of our students don't understand that they stand out. I had a student applying um, several years ago for this field experience in Costa Rica, and she's like, well, you know, how am I qualified? And I'm talking to her and talking to her and talking to her. And she was like in fifth grade, she took herself to Mexico to live with her grandmother in a shack where there's no running water because blah, 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 blah. And it's like, that's perfect. You know, you have the experience living in an uncomfortable or, you know, not a, a first world, a developed world situation, and you're fine with that. That's actually an asset as a student going to something like this or somewhere where you can be crammed in together and sharing bathrooms and doing hot and sweaty work all the time. So we ask questions about that. We're looking for, for ability to be a good team person, to be collaborative, to be flexible in the applications. Next slide. When we ask the faculty recommenders, um, same thing, you know, mature enough and resilient enough to handle many days of hard work under stressful conditions. So we're clear about who we're looking for early on. Next slide. And then, and then it was a challenge to prepare ourselves and our students as best we could in the limited time we had available. And mind you, they're also finishing finals and writing final projects and going to spend time with family and probably working like crazy to make money. So here's what we were able to do. And I'm just going to talk about the prep stuff and then pass it off for the, the in-person in stuff. 
Um, and these are the next six slides I just stole from what we did in some of these preparation meetings. So these are slides straight from there, but we talked about the benefits of teaming and what we know about teaming and particularly teaming with heterogeneous groups. Go on. Um, and talked about why you proactively build teams. What else do we say there? Oh, sorry. No, that's okay. Um, uh, Decision-making, yeah. approach to timing. Yeah, so we talked about just, just how good teams do these things ahead of time and they're communicating and, and un have a common understanding of things. Next slide. Um, we reminded them, so when we put out the applications, and I think then when we offered students a position on this trip, we're like, don't sign unless you're agreeing to all of these things. So again, being clear about your expectations up front. Um, and, and again, this one we kind of emphasize is like, this isn't like we cater to you. This is everybody does everything. Don't wait for us to ask you, look around what needs to be done. The five of them are here. We didn't know they were all coming, but they did that. They're like, oh, I'm free. I'll pitch in. Here we are. Thank you. Go on if you would. Okay. And then we, we did this, this workshoppy thing, credit here to the National Geographic presenters. Um, I was trying to pull... I was trying to pull materials I'd used from a um, different group observations I did, but they were all too mathy. Like they were activities that like were math that then led to the same lessons, but I couldn't use them. And then luckily I was at SOCMAS in October and they did this awesome thing, culturally conscious interactions, blah, blah, blah. And they led people through this interactive workshop where you're looking at, you know, where do you fall in terms of being very direct? Like, you know, Pilar, I really just don't like the fact that you brought us here Friday on a 10 versus you know, it's not inconvenient. It's stylistic. And those styles are sometimes determined by familial backgrounds, by cultural backgrounds, by personal characteristics. And we've kind of explored a bunch of things along those lines. Um, so here's what I told the students we'd be exploring. Communication styles are important, right? You might have, you might be crammed in a condo with somebody that, that will not, there's clearly some tension, but they won't talk to you about it. But maybe their cultural style is not to confront people. And maybe you're the kind of person who's like, let's put, put this out in the open. And there's going to be a conflict there unless both of you can understand that the other person might be working from a different set of assumptions. So we explored several of these things through this activity that the links are there for, but I don't think we're going to do because we want to hear from the students. Okay, So they're, they're kind of choosing where they were anonymously. And then we could, you know, like on different scales and different things. And then we could see where everybody was and talk about maybe, you know, if you're over on this end of the scale, being sensitive to and understanding where people are on a different end of the scale are coming from and where that might come from. And can I just add real quick? So these things are actually, um, it, it maybe doesn't, it sounds counterintuitive, but doing this type of experience in a disaster context is actually easier than doing it in a regular context because there's this visceral understanding that something is amiss and and that there's a very tangible way that that, that I think the students can, sense and all of us can sense that you know hey i gotta help out here whereas if we were going say to a, a long-term forestry project up in the mountains these things would all still matter but it would be easier for people to stay in their own heads and stay in their own traditional spaces so ironically even though it from the outside it looks like a crazier hard to do more chaotic type of situation which in some levels it is for these types of things about getting students to transform and getting to think outside of themselves, it's actually easier in these types of uh, contexts. So, okay. So we explored those interactively. And then this is kind of just the, the wrap up slide that, you know, there's culture, family, personality, past experience. They don't dictate how we behave, but they influence it. And the more self-aware we are and the more aware we are of how others might be, you know, frameworks from which others might be operating, the better we can, the better we can communicate and work with one another. Um, yeah, and, and you can see, so it's this, this is particular to our trip. And just a quote I like there. Okay. I do want to, if you'll click on that link. So we did, we couldn't do the everything. Student three, uh, yeah, yeah, the student prep one. We couldn't do everything in three sessions. So we could do that interactively. We had to give them a lot of logistics. We had to get them ready for a lot of things and fill out a lot of forms and stuff like that. We did some, some practice with some of the equipment out on the quad, but we were counting on them to do a lot of the preparation as well. What you see here is there's four categories of things people in place, uh, Claire and I have kept building on, but we are in, we are concerned that students know something about Native Hawaiian culture, the history of the Hawaiian Islands and how that's all come about. So there's some readings and videos there. Slow down. So that's, mm -hmm. that's, the, that's part A. Part B is new this year. We wanted to understand what had happened. There's some um, environmental 
science related things about why those things had happened, some climate change storms, land use questions and things like that. So there were some readings and some videos on that. And then the other stuff is whales and I think, I think what else. But so, so again, trying to provide material, we didn't follow, you know, so one of the lessons learned is we didn't follow up on, on this very well. We had it structured so like everybody would read a little bit in each category and then each student would read all of one category or watch videos. And but we, in all the scrambling around with everything, we never quite came back together and did the, the um, what do you call that? Uh, lessons learned. Or... The, the, the sharing out and, and, oh, yeah. and kind of the reinforcement of all that. And we also never held them accountable for reading that. We know they didn't talk, but I'm sure everybody here did. Uh, <laughs> everybody totally did all the readings. Everybody here totally did. The fourth category was about self-care. Oh, yes, that's right. Yeah, yes. So we were concerned, um, you know, because even in a non-disaster context, these trips can be stressful that you're out of your comfort zone and you're living you know, in close quarters and, and maybe you're tired and you're uncomfortable. Um, and so we wanted people to just be um, aware of their sort of personal status and, and how they were feeling and, and how to maybe take a moment, uh, particularly when, when in this disaster context, people might be feeling upset about what they were dealing with or, or maybe feeling in a position of either strong empathy for other people that they're working with. Um, so the, the self-care portion was really just about, you know, you need to be aware of your own status and feelings before we can help other people. We need to, you know, sort of make sure that we're all feeling okay. Mm -hmm. And let, let me add to that. We kept, we kept emphasizing many of us had been to Lahaina or had some connection with the island or because we have fires here locally, maybe had some connection with the Thomas fire or being, being here for evacuations. And so we all had our own emotions around these things. And, and one of our concerns was we would be inappropriately emotional with the people that had experienced the disaster and were still experiencing it. So we had a lot of conversation about keep it inside, we'll work it out together, you know, but, but like don't put your emotions on the people there. And, and, and which leads to. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, Daisy, do you want to? start talking about our evening uh, debriefs? Sure, and I think um, this is something that was really powerful since students were um, working on multiple, you know, different geographic locations. Um, an island is a lot bigger than you think it is. <laughs> and so uh, people were pretty spread out. And so um, and doing, you know, some were doing things with whales, some were doing service projects and so forth. And so we really prioritized having the meal times at the end of the day. Um, for people to communally cook together um, and we would choose one of the uh, rooms that um, students were staying in and they would kind of take charge of the meal or um, sometimes we ate outside in a larger patio area and um, and so both I would say that the community building I mean I would actually say the community building started with the car talks and the boat talks and probably uh, the plane talks too but just you know the um, Cindy really uh, modeled for me um, you know as we we're driving to our first um, uh, uh, Katie, uh, uh, student Katie and I were going to uh, the, the Pacific Whale Foundation for our first day of being on the water. And Sidney was, was talking about, um, you know, oh, I'm, I, I see a whale, I see a whale. And apparently and I learned that Cindy is obsessed with whales to a degree. <laughs> I didn't understand. And that, um, and she was really good at spotting all the, the spouts and everything. And so, and then was asking Katie lots of questions and really curious about Katie. And I was like, oh, you actually are, you know, it, it showed me like just that genuine individual interest in students. And then that really, that actually was great because then Katie and, our, Katie and I were on this boat all day together and that helped set our relationship up. And then, um, but all those sort of like in between times, like even though the the car rides are long and the boat talk, the boat trips are long, that that really was part of the community building. Um, and then coming together at the end, then we got to, um, students were both making meals together and resourcing around that. Um, I don't think we've talked about the Slack channel, but the Slack channel was also a community building space as well as a communication space. And, you know, just students readily got into like, does anybody have, you know, pineapple or whatever it is, or, you know, kind of like workshopping those meals. Um, and then the conversations we documented every night. Um, and so students would go around and um, the different groups would report back on what they had done. But, um, and initially it was kind of more like the reporting kind of piece. And then it, it, it quickly became more into um, really the social emotional piece and students um, reflecting on the experience really deeply and connecting it to their own experiences, um, becoming more vulnerable with each other. And um, and you could see um, our tech, Zach, who we haven't really talked about, but was essential to this trip, 
also really observed that transformation and really saw our students and their potential um, through the evolution of those conversations. So um, it, that was really key and it was really exciting to hear what people had done, but then eventually if someone had done something that someone else had done a previous day, then they could kind of connect in that way. Um, and it really just enriched the experience um, in addition to just you know, getting to be around, like I, I loved, I, I'm just, I, this is my chance to say that I actually, I absolutely adore these students. Um, I'm sad that I'm over here in the library right now and not in, <laughs> in the room with you. Um, but um, it was, you know, it, it, the more that we were together, the more that we wanted to be around each other, you know, I, and I think the more that, um, and we really weren't ready for it to end in a certain way, um, because it was, those, those interactions were so powerful beyond just the experience that we were having and the things we were doing. Um, to serve the community. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think I think um, uh, I think these um, these debriefs and these these uh, touch bases um, were um, one of the. I mean, we'll hear what the students have to say, but one of the highlights of the trip. Again, because of the nature of this, um, very rarely were we all together in a in a core activity. Like we were together every day, but we were rarely together. You know, like so like team A would leave at say 6 30 in the morning to go get to that boat so they can get out in the water. And then team B would go head to a school. And then the other, the remaining folks would go to um the Hawaiian um cultural center, right? Or or sometimes there would be a group at the Hawaiian Cultural Center, a group at the Pilinoho, and then it and, and so so we were all over the place. And so logistically, a lot of what a lot of what um uh you know. Zach or I or, or the faculty were doing was was moving people around, right? And, and making sure that we had enough people to do the the service that we needed for the particular uh, partner. Um, and so it was just, it's very hard. And so, so nobody got to see everything. No, no one person on this trip got to do every single event, got to do everything. So this evening thing was, was in addition to, um, um, in addition to just sort of talking about our experiences, et cetera, it allowed folks that couldn't be involved in activity A to get a sense of what was going on in activity A. And so everybody was included with everything, even if they weren't physically um, physically present with that particular partner. Georgina. Hey, Bob, what's this? We're going to go where? The school, the cultural center? So, so Georgina's question is, how did that work? And the answer was chaotically. So, so, sin, so, so because our biggest logistical constraint were boats that's usually how it would start so okay so we need six people on this boat and two people on that boat and so and we would rotate so everybody would have an, as much as possible didn't always work out sometimes weather kicked up whatever but everybody had at least a day if not more on one of the small boats and then we were also on this larger vessel that was so by small boats we mean is is like about you know the size of two of these tables kind of thing and and uh and the larger boats would be like 100, 150 people kind of size boat. So, so everybody, as so we kind of rotated through, and then it was like, okay, how many people do we have left? Okay, so we have 12 people left today. We have 16 people left today. And then it was a matter of contacting our partners and saying, oh, sorry. So first was the boats. The next most important thing were our school, our, our, our elementary, middle school engagements. And so, because we had to set those up ahead of time. And so, okay, I need these number of people. And then it became... Whoever was left over, we're going to start rotating you through the different uh, groups. Um, so it was literally each night before when people are eating dinner, it's like Cindy and I kind of like, okay, was it how many? Seven? And there's like three. Okay, was it four? And it's like, what? And then at dinner, we'd say, okay, tomorrow, Simon's going to blah, blah, blah. And, and we'd kind of read through the list that way. So it was very much dynamic and, and would change. And then sometimes... We would show up somewhere and like, oh my God, we really need a couple more people. Can you get a couple? So we're like, okay, well, actually, you too. So there was a lot of dynamic, not so much of the boats because the boats and you're on the boat, you're out there. But but the other things were, um, I also would say that it's not, it wasn't the case that someone went to do something on day, on on Tuesday and were there all day. A lot of times, maybe you're there for a half day, and then we would, like halfway through the day, we'd rotate you and move you to another group. So there was also. Um, sometimes multiple activities a, a particular student was engaged with on a given day. Yes, we needed, we needed, we had three cars because my lovely wife uh, uh, contributed uh, to, uh, which we still have to reimburse her for, uh, but, um, but uh, we originally had some extra vehicles, we had two core vehicles. Uh, yeah, so I'll just talk, 
talk about a little thing here. We have a, a van. Everybody clap for us. There's 20 years in trying to get this van. So this is, everybody thinks this is sort of Sean's tip or Sean's, Sean's anger. This is an equity thing. 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 This is a fairness thing. This is how to be a professional university thing. We need transportation. We need transportation here at CSUCI. We need transportation when we're elsewhere. The biggest challenge for these types of trips logistically, in my opinion, over the last, say, eight years, is it's almost impossible to get a large passenger van. Even though we register them, even through the school vendor, and we confirm a couple of weeks ahead of time, yes, we have two you know, large, you know, 12 passenger, 15 passenger vans, whatever, um, show up and invariably there is no van. New Orleans, Hawaii, wherever it is. And so, so these, 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 this category of vehicle is not as common as it used to be and it's really essential. So what we had is we had minivans, we had sort of larger SUVs, um, but really what we really need to help these things are actual, you know, cargo van moving people uh, types of things. So we had three vehicles for the trip and that was barely enough. Yeah, that even didn't seem. We awesome. really needed four. Yeah. We really needed four. Um, four, because again, there's 20 students and then five of us, that's 25 people. Yeah. Always, always the arrival and the departure is insane because people have bags. And so those days we have to, you know, get extra transportation or do multiple trips. And that's sort of a given, but, but for the, you know, it was not a, everybody here and then we'll walk down to the Harbor type of trip. It was, you're going to drive for 45 minutes over there to work at this. You guys are going to drive 20 minutes over there. So the logistics is absolutely um, non-trivial. And that's why a couple of us went a couple days early because I just need, we just needed to drive between these places. And even though I know there's a road that's working, is it full of construction equipment? Can we not, does it take two hours to get there or 45 minutes? So that logistics part is absolutely uh, essential. And so for folks planning a trip like this, I would strongly recommend, if possible, going for a long weekend, say a month or so ahead of time, and just sort of check in the lay of the land because particularly in a disaster context it doesn't matter what the news says it doesn't matter what somebody says from a month ago the stuff can change rapidly when we were there um we, we finally began removing the process of removing debris from these from some of these damaged properties and so one of the drives that we took the first for the first like part we were there say from where we were in the Lahaina area to sort of the more middle of the island area was about a 30 minute, 30, 35 minute drive. When the debris truck started going, sometimes it was 35 minutes, sometimes it was, you know, an hour. And those kind of things you just don't know. And that makes a huge difference. Um, and so, so having, or having a colleague on the ground that actually drives those areas or, or experiences really, really key for the successful planning. I want to get to the students talking, but I want to add one thing. That it is also that they took independence and they figured out the bus. You know, so we had you know the first, I think the second day, I'm out in the, in the channel on a boat, and they're like, "Hey, Pat Will Group is ready to be picked up." I'm like, "It's going to be three hours." You know, we're not even back to the ramp. We're not on our way back, but there's a bus that goes along that part of the island. I think it was Carson Island where we went. They're like, "We'll take the bus." Um, and then the, yeah. group, the group, I mean, I'm just I think all of you at least once on that group. Going to one of our distribution sites so that you can take the bus. We don't need you to drive us. So, you know, the independence and then the initiative taken um, was also, I think, part of the growth and, and cool stuff. But let's go to the next slide. Oh, wait, sorry, Ryan. There we go. All right. But can I say one, I want to say one last thing about that mandatory fun. Nice. Mandatory fun. So, this is a, a concept that uh, uh, our scout troop talked about, and that's really key. So everybody will be exhausted. So like, hey, we're gonna go hear some music tonight. Hey, we're gonna go do this, right? Packing the schedule full um, seems like maybe that's not a good idea because people would be exhausted. We're only there for 10 days. And, and I think if you just, oftentimes if you give students an opportunity, like, hey, do you guys wanna hang out tonight? Or do you wanna go do whatever? A lot of people would say, and understandably, and people always could. If people were feeling exhausted, they had a headache, people always could just hang out. But the ex expectation is, hey, we're not only going to do the service, we're going to do some, some culture here. We're going to go hang out. We're going to go do a, we ran a 5K, some of us, right? Like that kind of stuff. Um, uh, that is, uh, and not everybody was a runner. I'll just say not everybody was a runner. Says Robert, not everybody was a runner. Uh, but, um, but those kinds of things um, really are helpful, right? Because it's not like, 
do you want to go do this? But this is a cool aspect. Who knows if we're ever going to be back here in our life, right? Who knows if we're ever going to come back here? Here's this really cool, whatever, musician experience, uh, museum exhibit, you know, whatever. Let's go see it. And so put that in the schedule, like, like put that in and you can always dial it back, but, but um, go do plan more than you think you need is way better than not planning enough and then trying to add some stuff later. People will be exhausted and they'll go, I don't think I want to add something on. So, okay, with that, uh, students. Can we have you guys, because you guys are the stars of the show, can we have you guys come up closer to the speaker? And I will, can you stop sharing your screen for a minute or, or uh, enlarge that guy so I can see? Yeah, that one. So I can just, like, there we go. Yeah. Yeah, so. I'll turn the lights off. Perfect. Okay. So our, our questions here, you can talk about whatever, our questions are, how were you able to bridge what you learned from the classroom? Uh, uh, what did you learn there that you couldn't learn in the classroom? And, and what's, uh, what's the value of service learning for you guys? Or whatever you want to talk about. I think for me, um, for say who you are. Oh, sorry. I'm Carissa, uh, anthropology major, um, but I have some environmental background, and I was really nervous about going on this trip because um, I'm not in the ESRM program, so I don't know people. But after the very quiet plane ride, um, we very closely, like, and quickly, like, got to know each other, and I think that was a really important aspect of being able to work with each other. And um, what was really, really cool was that like all these things that you learn about in like lab classes and like in the classroom with like doing water quality testing, microplastics, or like talking about community and talking about like culture. Um, it's like, it's nothing if you don't have the context of like learning about it, like by interacting with people. And so like, actually getting to talk with the community who are there and like experience and everything um and like just getting to interact with them like really changes your perspective and really makes you understand like why you're learning what you're learning um and yeah so that's my bit to start it off <laughs> uh, I'm Max um like I said I'm a biology major Chicano major and minor in ESRM and I was also really nervous to go on this trip when I first heard about it. I just transferred, so I knew nobody at the university, and I was scared of everybody. Um, but you know, it's it's like she said, like after the plane ride, I think we really just like settled into Hawaii. And I would like recommend this trip for anybody that wants to go because we did take multiple majors. You don't have to be in ESRM to do it. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm Cassandra, ESRM major, minor in biology, same thing. I've been here for five years and I still didn't know anybody. So <laughs> <laughs> it was nice showing up and then coming out with 18 new friends. Now I go to class and I'm like, oh, we're besties now. Um, so we're able to talk better. Um, something that I was able to bridge between classes and the Maui trip, um, more in the scientific field, was I take a lot of pictures of rocks. I just like it. So being able to be like in coastal management and um, seeing all this, like shaping the coast and hearing about microplastics and everything, I'm going back through the pictures and I'm like, oh my God, like I saw this in there. And then I go back in my notes and I'm like able to bridge them together. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm a scientist. <laughs> it's, it's nice. It's a great feeling being able to connect both and then being like, I did that in class or um, explaining to my classmates like how this worked and that worked. And I'm, I just feel really good about myself. Like it makes sense now. I'm Rob, Rob Smith. Um, I'm a psychology major and also looking to minor in English. So yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think, um, gosh, I think the most important thing for me was like actually the, the diversity of everybody like going into the trip and Max touched on it a little bit before, but being able to just, you know, like come from different backgrounds, like obviously there's a majority of people that are coming from a more scientific background, but like being one of those people that wasn't, I think it like really helps to have different people that know like different kinds of things per se, to be very general about it. But um, I know a lot of the classes that I took here, 
um, even just like prior to the trip, you know, I, I didn't even know I was going to go on this trip. I, I, I applied super last minute. Somehow I made it in and it like changed my life for the better. I, it really, I'm like trying not to freak out here, but <laughs> it, it really like gave me the opportunity to like see that I, I still had like things in myself that I didn't know before. Like, yeah. I definitely was going through a really hard time before this. And like, like all these people showed me that I still have like the capacity to be good, you know, and like that we can actually help people that like need it, you know, like you see a lot on the news and things like that. And it's like, it's like you know, it's like a thinking problem, man. It's like people can like think they're helping out just by like, you know, oh, like we're there, like we support you as much as you can, but like actually like putting your work in and putting like the effort in to do these things. Like I, I had a really, really good teacher. I'm totally blanking on her name because I'm an idiot. Um, but, but it was like an intro to like, like ethnic studies and race. And it was like the perfect class to have before this because we touched on like every single portion that you could have of like the human experience. Like why people have these things that like, why people are, you know, put into like subgroups and things like that makes them feel like way worse than they have to be. And like us being there can show them like people care. Like it's not just like, I don't know, I'm just kind of dialoguing now, but like it's like, you know, people really do still care. And like, again, without this experience, like I, I wouldn't have this, you know, I would, I would be a shell of myself still and I would be into things that just like shouldn't be. Like, this is, this is giving me the opportunity to change for the better. And I think you can do that for any, if it, if it, if it can do it for me, man, it can do it for anyone. Sweet. Um, my name's Simon, uh, ESRM major, Marine Coastal Systems. And I feel like I, I'm just gonna reiterate basically what everybody else has said. Um, this was my first, this was after my first semester here. And so really new, um, didn't know anybody. Um, and it was just such a community builder, like to like find like the bed, like the way they vetted students was just like everybody showed up and it was within the, like we all kind of have the same mindset of just like showing up and helping out. Um, and so I just feel like I gained such a strong community that I've been like searching for and wanting. And, you know, like I, you're told to like vibe at a certain level and people will kind of meet you there. And I feel like that's what I saw and have was met with on that trip and yeah just getting that community like even with the teachers as well like homies every, <laughs> every day. Um, yeah I, I just love that and I like I feel like I found my place and that feels so good to like show up on campus and have friends um and see friends around campus that holler at you and just and special um so wouldn't have this like would not yeah yeah wouldn't have this without so awesome awesome uh, do you guys have any questions for these guys <laughs> i think that's a, I'll, I'll just point out that like in our esrm program like historically we would do like lots of field work and we'd go out to the island and we'd have any kids together and so we're sort of outside the classroom a lot and that did build like a really strong community with our students. I'm sorry, I'm a little far away, further away from the microphone. That built a really strong community with our students. Um, and during the pandemic, like a lot of that went away. So people were very isolated, um, particularly like students that had gone through high school or like the last year of high school or first year of college online. Like it really kind of broke that community building that, yeah, that totally, we had totally. part of the culture in our university and in our program. And it's really cool to be able to do service learning where you think about somebody else other than yourself, you're focused on this group activity where you all kind of haul in together, working together. Um, and it does build this like phenomenal community. Like you guys, they all still talk to each other and they volunteer <laughs> and, and like, it's, it's really a beautiful thing. And like, we hope that this has lit like a little fire of like community building within our 
university. So um, thank you so much, all of you. Like, yeah, that was it's, great. It's really great. Appreciate you sharing your experience. So, can you, and so just to follow with what Claire was saying, so you guys have your own communication channel now outside of our Slack, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So you yeah, guys can talk to each other without us around, and you actually do talk to each other without us around, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like, we actually have tried to like, and emphasis on tried. It'll happen. <laughs> One day we'll figure it out. But we've, we've tried to like organize like volunteering outside, mm -hmm. um, just as like a bigger group, like non-affiliated, obviously, but like just as a like, you know, a group of students. So um, I would say that that fire that was lit is still going. Yeah. For sure. yeah. yeah. And you guys are working on going, I think, on a group camp up the coast and doing some service up on, on the central coast. Um, yeah. uh, would you have thought that that was what was going to happen when you saw this application, whatever, three months ago or something? No, no, I just did it on a whim. So like getting to be able to like experience this. And also like sometimes you can get really jaded being like just in this world in general. Um, but especially after probably the past like five, six years. Um, and so getting to work with people, it's like really inspiring again. And like, it makes you feel like you can be an active participant in the community, not just, you know, back in Maui, but also here in our local community and on campus and with, um, and like getting to reach out to people and like knowing that like, oh, I can make connections. It doesn't have to just be this transaction. It can be more than that and so like I don't know it's just it was a really really inspiring inspiring trip for me and like it definitely changed my perspective on a lot of things and like it makes me feel really encouraged entering into the world after I graduate that like I can carry all of that with me it's not just some experience that happened for 10 days like it's much much more than that yeah cool so I have um information for you all but we have a question for faculty um, so for you all that are interested in continuing uh, your work out in the community, so Regina and I, we lead the Center for Community Engagement, and uh, we have paid internships, and uh, Carissa was actually part of it. Um, we have a core program, and we pay students, and we, um, we link you with a nonprofit organization in the community, and we ask you to serve 100 hours uh, in a year at that nonprofit organization. We also have service days. Um, one is today. They're actually uh, at a, a ranch out in Somis, um, gleaning uh, lemons for the food pantry. So we uh, we can send you our contact information if you're interested for hiring for next year. Um, again, those are paid internships, and I think they run between 18 and 20 dollars. What, getting paid to do yeah. service? What? <laughs> Highly recommend. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and, and I want to just thank you for being so vulnerable and sharing your experiences. It's really beautiful to hear. Um, and then I have, uh, I just, I'm curious for the faculty, they have all, the students have shared how much this has transformed them. Um, I wanted to ask you all, how do you see this as like, transforming the way that you teach and use to yourselves? you see yourselves as faculty here? Okay. Yeah, so people online, just, so Pilar just asked how the trip impacted the faculty. Um, Do you want me to speak? Yeah, why don't you go first, Daisy? Yeah, I mean, this was by far the best experience I've had with students in years. Like, and I've been teaching for almost 30 years and I've been at CSUCI since 2005. Um, I, uh, as the students know, I originally was going to come back a few days earlier than I did um, because I'm chair and, you know, start of the semester. And I thought, you know, I'm sure the number of nights I'll be with them, that'll be more than enough. And I'll be so ready to go home. And I was just having that feeling like I, I was having such um, anxiety and dread over leaving. And I was having such a fear of missing out. I just, I didn't want to, I didn't want to leave them. So we were at this uh one e event one night and I said, well, maybe I should just go look and see if I can, you know, get a ticket a couple of days later. And it, it worked out perfectly. And, you know, even then I wasn't ready to go. Like I only came back because, you know, adulting, but, <laughs> but the, it was um, the, it, it is completely, I mean, for me, for someone who's been doing this this long and um, what Chris was sharing, definitely those same vibes about the last several years and can easily be jaded. Um, and this really renewed me and refreshed me 
um, unlike anything that I've experienced um, in my time here. And um, so, so now I voluntarily go to the class every Tuesday. It's not a class that I'm assigned to as an instructor. Um, and I just like being with everyone. Um, and I know that they like being with each other too. And that makes it really, um, and, they're, and they're so welcoming. I mean, honestly, like it's just, you see parts of students that you wouldn't otherwise see. And it really takes it out of that kind of, you know, I know we're all trying to transform the dynamic between faculty and students anyway and with you know different parts of campus and for me like this is just um this this will take me through like I'm gonna be sad when the semester ends too but I'll deal with it <laughs> and we'll stay in touch still yeah yeah so to be to be clear um there's three WTUs to do this class and so Claire and I split those so Cindy volunteered Stacy volunteered Zach basically volunteered <laughs> Um, and, you know, we even tried to say, hey, can we just give, you know, Stacy, you know, like you know, zero WTUs as an instructor title? So she, and like, no, can't do that, says the administration, right? So there's there's many institutional barriers here. And so um, the commitment from the fact, I mean, students are awesome, but also the commitment from the faculty is really what you have to have, because what, however these trips go, there will be some horrible roadblock that erupts and you just have to um you know take it on you just got to say okay screw it so so Cindy will volunteer and Stacy will volunteer and we'll figure out the reimbursement for the vehicles because we know we can't have less than three and we just need that right and and so so um not that we have to always be sacrificed sacrifice but but it takes a lot I, I really want to emphasize from the faculty perspective it takes a tremendous amount we can't do it without our administrative support we definitely can't do it without students but but i think sometimes um we don't really appreciate this and i think that scares a lot of faculty away they're like oh my god that sounds like um hawaii disaster so much work oh my god no and my response is like, what the hell are we doing here, right? We all came to this university, or most of us did at least, because we wanted to do something different. And service learning is a foundational thing that many of us think is transform transformative and is, is we either couldn't do it our previous institutions or maybe we couldn't do it the way we'd want to do. And so the downside here is you have to get paid whenever you get reimbursed or you have to do this for a volunteer. And know you, But the upside is that we get to do what the hell we think we should be doing. And, and this framework allows us to do that. And so, so if if you're afraid of work, it's like, well, yeah, but but the the awesome benefits are you guys can see these students, you see my colleagues, um, our partners, it's just freaking awesome, right? And so so, but I do want to emphasize that there is a lot of sacrifice that the faculty make that is not apparent. Um, and, uh, and and we couldn't do this without those sacrifices. It would be great if there was a way to minimize, I don't think they'll ever go away, but if we could minimize some of those sacrifices, that would be great. Um, but but th that's the reality of how this stuff plays out on our campus. Okay, I wanna jump in. I'll come stand next to Chris because I wanna stand in the microphone. Um, so the first time I got to do a service learning trip was, was I volunteered um, the, about a year after I joined CSCCI. I volunteered to. Um, I stand large. I stand large. There you go. Great. Perfect. I volunteered uh, to go on one of Sean's New Orleans service learning trips, uh, and it was still fairly kind of early. You know, it was within about eight years, I think, of the of the disaster that had happened there, um, and it was really phenomenal. It was exhausting, and <laughs> and like keeping up with Sean is is hard um, because it is like so many things were scheduled and from like physical field work, hacking through the blackberries um, to going to the jazz club at night. Um, but all of that, the car talks, the hacking through the blackberries with students kind of thing. Um, it was really great. The transformational part for me, I think was really to understand that it's okay for me. Well, it was very humanizing in, in both directions, right? So it was okay for me not to be perfect and, and to feel tired in front of people and to just, you know, have those real conversations one-on-one -on -one with, you know, person to person. So that was very transformational. Um, and just seeing the power of how the students were affected and I was affected by that whole experience. I think there are about 12 or 15 uh, people on that trip. Um, so it was really great to be able to sort of see how Sean modeled that service learning trip. Um, a few years later, he and I did a trip, an international version to the Cook Islands, which was a whole other like layer of complexity, like halfway across the world um, on an international trip. But that was really great 
Uh, we did a lot of different um, research activities uh, and then getting involved with Cindy and Rachel to do the the Hawaii trip has been really good. Um, uh, so doing the research, I think it's just phenomenal being able to be that close to Wales, seeing how excited students get doing the research. Um, having great partners like Dr. Cartwright and Amy Venema, who's one of the boat drivers and part of the Kiki Kahola project, working with Cindy, like that's really great. And I think really good for students to see like uh, women in science doing these badass things, driving boat, chasing chasing whales around in boats and uh, and and hauling anchors and things. Um, so I think that's great to model that, and again to just to have that that human um, interaction with 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 people and and these really kind of teams that form very very tight knit relationships very quickly. And again, I think that continues into other areas of our teaching and our our experiences. So, would you like to come up and share? Oh. So this will be a little bit duplicative, but hopefully not completely. But I was thinking, and I, and I told the students this our, our last night there when we were doing our big reflection and we're all like, oh. Um, but if you gave me two labels and one was mathematician, one was educator, I gravitate, I gravitate, ah, gravi, <laughs> gravitate, there we go, gravitate we towards educator with mathematics as a tool to do that. Because it happens to be my discipline. It's fine. It's great. It's good for critical thinking, but I'm an educator. And this sort of thing is so much more about the relationships we form and how we can educate and I learn from those relationships than any sort of campus-based class is ever going to be. Mm -hmm. I mean, the time we spend together, the you know, the getting hot and dirty and tired and saying, oh, well, look, I haven't washed my hair, guys, sorry, mm -hmm. um, or whatever it is. Um, <laughs> but the, I mean, really, it's the amount of time, but also it's the students and their coming to a place of openness and vulnerability and, and modeled as, you know, especially by Rob, as you just saw there, um, but, but trusting one another and trusting us um, really allows for what you might call mentoring, but really is just sharing and learning from one another. And I love that. It hurts me that ever since the pandemic, I don't have that kind of a strong relationship with most of the students in my classes. They're not coming to my office. Mm -hmm. There's been a change in behavior. Mm -hmm. There's also been a change in me. I've gotten older. They probably find me harder to relate to. Um, but but those long conversations, you know, Stacy was referring to just, you know, drawing the students out, getting to know about them. I have to know about them to be able to say, hey, you know, you should you should apply for this paid research internship or, you know, let me send you something about that. Or there's this campus group you might want to belong to. There's this conference that you should maybe think about going to. Like without knowing them, it all falls on deaf ears. Um, and so so I'm grateful to them for putting themselves out there. Yeah, it's a ton of it's a shitload of work, to be honest. Um, but the the outcomes are so good. I, I, you know, every time it comes up, I'm willing to do it again. And, and this trip in particular, because of the the service to the people who've been so um, horribly affected by the fires, really just like blew out of the water any past trips. They've all been great. Students have changed their lives. They've changed their destinations. Um, they bonded. But the the level of those things on this trip was so much greater. Um, and really because of the service learning and the reflections that are that are a key part of service learning. So that's why yeah, I would I would say that um uh yeah, all this stuff is awesome. I'd echo everything my fellow uh, my colleagues said. Um I'd also say that one thing that um I found uh disappointing um in recent years is some of the conversations about these experiences amongst uh, some of our faculty colleagues. And so there's some talk about these things as being um sometimes elitist. I've heard people talk about these experiences, going to the island, doing these service learning are elitist. Um, they're not for everybody. They're for like the kids in the clique. No, I mean, it, it's, it's those, those comments are so devoid from reality. It's shocking. And I think some of that is played into some of the challenges of getting funding from IRA. This notion that, oh, this isn't, this isn't as important an experience as this other type of activity, right? All of the stuff we support with our students have value. They, they truly do. But there's this strange narrative that's sort of creeping up in some circles that this isn't that important, right? And I, again, I think it was the pandemic a lot because we, as everybody mentioned, we stopped doing these things. And, and students that, that are, say, on the IRA committee that vote to vote funds, like they, they don't, they haven't known these, this transformational ability. Um, uh, and then, then some things have just gotten compounded. But um, those comments are completely false and they're offensive and they're wrong. 
these experiences, as I think you guys all heard from the students and, and from us, are truly transformational. And we would love it to take every, to have the ability to take every one of our undergrads on one of these experiences, but that's just unrealistic. But to have more of these opportunities for more students is key. Um, we uh, were fortunate and then we had some additional money from some of our local uh, coast money for so students could apply for a essentially a scholarship to help defray the costs. Um, we're very conscious of the costs for this trip. It, it, I mean, it costs what it costs. We, we love to find additional funding sources and things. The foundation, I think, is interested in, in helping with that. But, but, um, but uh, these experiences are democratic. These experiences are for everyone. And, um, and I think because we go to places like New Orleans or the Cook Islands or, 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 or Hawaii, I think from afar, people kind of see, oh, you're going to New Orleans and it's like a fun place. Oh, you're going to Maui and that's the, oh, Musa had a hard break, right? You know, those kinds of comments mm -hmm. um, completely and utterly miss the point. Um, one of the reasons why, why these experiences work so well is because these places do have intact cultures. They do have uh, peoples and traditions that um, give them strength, uh, strained as they might be, there still are these there are these different cultures than we're used to interacting with every day, and and that in and of itself is valuable. When you layer on the service, when you layer on these other things, it, it truly becomes transformational. And so, um, so I, I think part of our job as faculty is not just to say how great our students are, but to also talk specifically about the value of service learning and trip-based service learning outside of our typical bubble um, and how, how important those are. And, um, and, and they are available to all of our students, uh, you know, different walks of life. And to be clear, the requirement for IRA-based trip is there can be no prereqs, right? We, we have some we have criteria and this and that. But it's not as if you have to be a blah, blah, blah major. It's not as if you have to have taken class X, Y, and Z. It might be helpful. It might, might encourage you guys to do that. But, but there, there are no barriers to entry other than being an undergraduate at CSUCI, despite what some people, how some people read sometimes into these, uh, into these things. Um, and so uh, I think that's on us, but I think it's also uh, on all of, uh, not just us, but all of us to share these experiences with our colleagues and, and celebrate um, all the great uh, work that can be done through these uh, experiences. John, can I jump in on this sure. point? Is that, um, so one thing I was saying yesterday when we were at home and I said, you know, I, I've, I'm fortunate that I have been able to go to Hawaii quite a bit. Um, I've never spent, I've never gone to Hawaii where I didn't go to the beach. And I've never gone to Hawaii where I spent so much time in a car and doing, you know, or in, you know, unlit warehouse type settings. Like it, it I think that um, sometimes the assumptions about these locations, just like we live in California, people think that we live in a vacation land, right? And is your life a vacation? Probably not. You know, a lot of the sites that are the sites of um, where where work is needed, where and where cultures are fraught, um, are sites that look like um, exotic locales. They look like vac you know, and these are people's homes. These are their lives. And so um, I think a lot of the cultural assumptions that we might make with these uh, locations are also the kind of thing that we're undoing with this kind of trip and helping people see that this is their daily life. Like, you, like you think it's funny that it costs six dollars to buy a banana at a store? Like, imagine if you lived in a place where it costs six dollars. You know, whatever it is, it's you know, there's all kinds of ways in which, um, you know, the location itself might sound like like, oh, you guys must really be kicking back. And so I think it's it's, it's really great that we can flip that script um, and that students can really see to that, you know, what, what a lived life looks like um, in these different locations. Yeah, so I, I want to build on that, if I may. Okay. So I want to ask the students, what, what one resonating or two resonating, you can either do it collectively or you can each come up with your own, but what, what one message would you want to send out to people? You're kind of preaching the choir here a little bit, right? <laughs> you know, we're already bought into service learning in this room. But if you have like an external message for faculty, for administrators about this sort of thing, what would it be? <laughs> no pressure. Uh, <laughs> For, for me, uh, it was really around uh, giving the opportunity to form a community around like what we're learning, uh, like, yeah, forming community around like where we're at and getting into research. Uh, I think that was huge, like that we could have friends and do something really cool, research something so cool that I never thought to have the opportunity to do and just 
researching whales. It's so far out and like, <laughs> I, I, yeah, a year ago, I'd, I'd say I'd never be on this trip. And so this is, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll touch a little bit on what they were talking about, but like every single day, they talk about like how packed our schedule was, but I think like it was like a 10 hour day, every single day, you mm -hmm. wake up, you go to sleep after working no break so if if there's anything to be learned there like it's that if you like put the work in you can see like the efforts of your work you know and that and the trip shows that like a lot like you know we have people reaching out to us from the groups mm -hmm. that like all that we help that and they're like hey like just want to let you know here's like what it looks like and thank you so much for helping us like it means the world to us so like this, this kind of stuff, like if there's any question about it, it like, no, there's no question that this is like probably the most valuable thing that I've done on campus and probably with my short life that I've lived. So, <laughs> um, and I promise I won't cry. <laughs> um, I just want to thank the faculty because now hearing all of this, like I know it was a lot of work, but after hearing all of that and like listening to everything that happened in the background before we were even in the picture. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how they were able to put everything together in such a short period of time. And then having the fires, like having that change in schedule and being able to really work with it. Mm -hmm. And like, we had to be flexible, but they had to be even more flexible with it. Like they had to understand that we were all different and we we're gonna come into this place and we, we didn't know what we were gonna get ourselves into. It, it's amazing to see how everything just worked out and blended together. I think it's waking up with everybody. It, it's just great. Now I just go to class and I'm not scared of the doctor still anymore. Like I'm talking about my capstone project. I'm like, oh, doctor's got any help. <laughs> so it it helps us as well. Like I don't know if like they understand how much it impacted our lives, but a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I would say to any professors that want to do something like similar and set up their own kind of thing that they should absolutely go and do it. And it's a lot of work, but the students are going to see like your work and really appreciate it like years down the line. And you're going to help the student learn so many things and grow as a person and help them in personal ways. Because I was going through a really tough time when I saw this opportunity. I know other students had their own struggles, um, but you really help build a community and change our lives for the better. Yeah, um, I would say like this kind of opportunity, it allows you to get outside yourself and allows you to um, really just like for both, I think, professors and for the students, like we all get outside ourselves. We humanize each other. And like you going to Maui, like it's a different kind of experience because the community there, like they really practice community care. That's such an important thing to them about like really just making sure that their neighbor is okay. And like coming from here where it's like a little bit different, there's a detachment, I think. Um, and so like getting to build like our own community while also participating in someone else's community and like where they were so welcoming and so embracing to us where like they really had, they had no right to like, they, they, they didn't need to at all with being forgotten from, you know, the mainland. Um, and so like getting to participate in that uh, community care and embracing it into our own lives, I think was like a really important aspect. And I think should really be put on to more students to be able to experience that um, because that's how you affect change is being able to actually like participate in that. And so, um, yeah, I think it's important for faculty to be able to help facilitate that for students because that's a different kind of learning. I think I got one more little thing here is that like this like sparks less like we were talking about how like we all form as a group and like we want to go volunteer somewhere else mm -hmm. like this you don't just have to like go you know you don't have to go to now to like volunteer like there's opportunities yeah. everywhere and like <clears throat> this can be like the start of showing somebody that like I volunteer at like the basic needs hub now like every week mm -hmm. just because like I want to you know there's there's other contacts for me of course but like bottom line is I want to do that because like I've been shown that it actually has some sort of meaningful impact. Like that is, is like paramount. And I think that might be kind of lacking just because of the whole, like we're stuck inside for three years and then mm -hmm. we come out as like completely different people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
other questions people have for the students? I'm just wondering how would you like to manage your homework when you got to <laughs> <laughs> or other assignments, other responsibilities? Did you guys have like uh, automatic reply? Like, <laughs> <laughs> just that happen? I I actually had a, a winter class leading up to it, so I had to like jam like a winter course even further. Like, and so I, I try to finish that a week early. It was tough, like long <laughs> nights, but I like so worth it. And like, just so worth to like put in the work, like a lot of work to get there. And then I could like enjoy just being there. So yeah, there's this cool feature on your email where you can schedule an email ahead of time. <laughs> that's what I did. <laughs> my mentors and I was like, oh, send it at this time, 8 a.m. <laughs> so I think I woke up. <laughs> I will say that like this class does have it bleed into this semester too. We do have the whole follow-up yeah. portion with it as well. Yeah. Um, but like again, you learn like how to manage your time. Like if there's any again, another portion of the trip is like we're running around all the time. Mm -hmm. You gotta learn like when you gotta be places, where you have to be places, and more importantly, why you have to be there. Mm -hmm. Like that is it's like it's essential. It's, it teaches you like scheduling. It teaches you how to like show up and have a good attitude when you show up because you have to. And like once you get like, I don't know, they talk about like practice, you know, like you're trying to practice something. Right. So if you're practicing like doing mandatory service work, next thing you know, you're just going to be doing it because it's already ingrained in you. You know, it's like kind of like. I don't know, like in child rearing, you know, like uh, this weird example. <laughs> you're trying to like raise like a kid to do the right thing, right? So like if you're training your brain to do the right thing by volunteering, of course it's going to bleed out somewhere else, you know? And um, just as far as like the work goes, yeah, like I'm taking five classes this semester, you know, uh, yeah. with this included. And I wouldn't have it any other way. Like this, it's fine. Like you, you learned to take care of it, and then like you learn to prioritize what things and how to do it. Like, yeah, I'd say like this is the class that I like look forward to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm like, oh cool, I'm gonna go see people that like I got to spend ten days with doing really hard work, and like, you know, we're still doing hard work with you know presenting our posters and like doing the analyzation afterwards, but like that this is something that I look forward to compared to some of my other classes and like working full time um, for the that, that's what I had to probably to answer your question like prep for was like making sure that my work would be prepared for my time off and then I'm like all right like I've got to focus in on this like I got to be able to show up for this so like sorry that's, <laughs> that's great. That's great. I think that is hard because it's way more than a three credit class. Yeah. 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 Together. But I, I'm love it, it. And nobody taught you these these things that you sort of learned how to do yourselves. Um, you just kind of learned it yourselves. And and I, I love that it's kind of helping in other areas or it's it's building foundation in other areas of, of, of your lives and your classes. So that's really cool. Yeah, and I'll just add, uh, I just put up our blog. You guys can check out. It's maui.esrm.zone. Um, do not want to leave the impression here that we, we this was a perfect experience and we had everything totally right all the time. Um, but one thing that has helped a little bit with the issue of how do you manage the people back home is to have a blog. And so unfortunately, the way we were getting it set up and because of the tight time schedule, there was a there was an issue with our um the service that provides our our uh, um, CI keys that I couldn't resolve, and we had eventually had some have some help from IT help us, which is great. But what it meant was that we didn't really fully get the blog up and loaded before the trip as should as we should have had. So what you'll see is you'll see different um, uh, you'll see different uh, student posts and things. There should be a lot more, um, but just because of the logistics stuff, it was it was hard. It wasn't fully turned on, um, but. This really helps. So this allows students to to drop breadcrumbs and to do a little memory type of thing. And for importantly, for the people back home. So oftentimes it's like girlfriends, it's like parents that might have some anxiety. What are you doing? What do you like? They can just go to this and sort of get a sense of what's going on. And that reduces the amount of sort of texting and amount of bugging that sometimes bugging is not the right word, but 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 uh, outreach from loved ones from that aren't in this experience and allows students to be more in this in the place and 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 just 
work on their experiences for this, you know, less than two week period that they have. And so, so this I think is a best practice. And even though we didn't do it great here, this type of tool can really help. Um, also sometimes not so much this trip, but on my other trips that typically go around spring break, um, we're not supposed to go, we're supposed to travel only during spring break. So for my recording here, I'm going to say we only travel during spring break. We never leave a day or two early or might come back a day or two after. But if that were to ever happen, um, uh, that's communicated well ahead of time to the students. And it's their responsibility to talk to their faculty or their job folks and, and say, hey, you know, I, I'm leaving on day X. And that's and I always offer to, you know, I'm more than happy to you know, you should do that first. But if you get stuck or they want proof or whatever, talk to me. So I have given a, fine, a midterm, for example, like on the plane type of deal. Very rarely, most people are like that's fine. We'll we'll adjust the schedule. But but um, but being able to have suggest that they work this out. But if they need help, we have their back, and and that this is a real thing. They're not like going on some kind of, you know, spring break party. You know, it's not like that type of an experience. Um, I think those couple things really help cut down and then the students own maturity to sort of, you know, take agency and make sure that they, um, you know, they, it's valuable for them to be in that place in time and focused in that place in time. And so they, they have, they give themselves the gift of having that full experience. Georgina. Um, I just want to thank you. I think you're amazing educators and you gave that great that's why I came here because I wanted to be an educator like you, so it's the best and it's this kind of experience that really made all the difference to your life changing experiences. Um, uh, they serve as catalysts for great transformation for the life. You're really changing life, and that's really important here. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your work. I hope you take me with you next time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now we're going to talk about the human. You talked about how the trip was humanizing. Um, um, you learned a lot about people. Can you share, like, what kinds of experiences did you learn? Like, the human impact, or like, what were like human stories? How we endured loss and grief and, and losing everything. I wanted to know more about the specific human experiences that you learned about that stuck with you. Yeah. Um, I would say like there was one uh volunteer aspect that we did. It was that like the Native Hawaiian Council at their distribution center. And um these people would honestly have to find rides like 45 minutes away from where they're living in order to get to the center, um, just to get basic need items. Um and you would have to sit down and you have to talk to them because you would basically be like going through like the warehouse and picking up items that they stated they needed. And so um, I did that for two of my days and getting to sit down and talk with them. And like, even though it's in a short moment and you're trying to get through this long line of people who need these items, you kind of learn like where they're coming from. And like, they're, you know, a lot of them would have to share cars and like, they would have experienced loss and like, Sometimes something would come up in the conversation where they would tell some tell you something that would have that had happened to that happened to them about or like how they're taking care of their grandkids now um, because they lost their their children. Um, so getting to experience that face to face and like having those conversations with people um, really like changes you because in that moment, you want to make sure that you are not putting your own emotions onto them um, and that you're not impacting them further, um, but you're being there as kind of like a, a stable body, someone who can assist them in that situation. Um, and so in that sense, it's like, it's really humanizing being able to interact with someone who's in that situation and just like, be there solely for them in that moment and try to just assist them in whatever way that your capacity has. And even walking them to the car, there would be moments where like, they would like be giving me hugs and like, they're like, oh, like, thank you so much. And it's like, I like, I don't want anything from this situation except to make sure that you are being taken care of. Um, and so, yeah, I would say that like kind of interaction was like just really, um, it was really hard. Um, and that's why we would have those debriefing talks at the end of the night to talk about that. 
but also just really um just very like humbling and like understanding that like we have these human connections and like even if someone is in an entirely different situation than you are you can still um connect in some way and have like you know maybe a shared like funny moment or like a shared like heart moment um and so yeah I would say that was probably like a big thing for me was being there um yeah I think that's one of the most impactful parts of this trip is that you really get to connect to like the human side and what they've gone through and what they've lost I know personally I've always had a tough time connecting with people that's why I'm a biology major <laughs> <laughs> but this really did like help me connect with like what they're going through and that I really wanted to help them and I wanted to give them everything in the world and everything that they needed but I didn't have enough time to do that on this trip but you really like get to connect with them and they tell you like they get really um vulnerable with you and I know we also spoke with like a, a spiritual leader as well we were in Hawaii and he like he like I don't know kind of I remember it as like he taught us all these lessons and he hopes that we bring it back to California and we help our own communities and, you know, that we're always welcome back in Maui. So that was really impactful for me. Um, so I like to pick people's brains pretty much because I'm a psych major. <laughs> I think every single place that I went to, I tried to talk to at least like one person just to like kind of gauge the experience that people had. I know these guys can like detest that. I'm like, I wasn't even like really, I was talking with everyone you know, just trying to get a feel of like what's going on and like what, what's like the general mindset around everybody. And, you know, everybody has their own different story is what, is what you see. You know, you talk to the guy outside of like, you know, the ABC story skating with his like, or he's teaching his kid how to skateboard. And he's like, yeah, our whole house burnt down. Mm -hmm. And like, um, it had all of our money in it. And like, now we're homeless. And then you like go over to like, you know, uh, Napoli Noho, which is like one of the places that we volunteered and like, you know, you'll hear the exact same story, but just like different context, you know? So it's it's like the underlying issue is like, you see that all these, this has, this has affected every single person that it can affect, mm -hmm. you know? And like looking at that, it, you know, it's, 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 it's hard, you know, it's, it's really, it's really hard to take that all in. But what you can see out of that is that like how much we're really helping when we're there and like how much we can actually gauge like our own interactions back here. Like it, it definitely more than human humanizing. You said, I think you said this, but like it humbles, it humbles you a lot. You know, you, you realize that maybe like, Oh, like things here like aren't so bad. And like, we can actually take the time that we have here to do something else and like make things better. Yeah. Um, I think something that we didn't really talk about was that a lot of the people that we um, were living in in this condo resort resort mm -hmm. it was um like our neighbors were probably um hawaiian people that were there that lost their homes mm -hmm. i know one of our classmates um, that was there she was in the pool area like way after and she was talking to somebody and she had lost everything and they were living there at the resort and it's not like out of their pocket or if it was there out of their pocket they got a lot of funding to be able to live there i think also the week that we were there recently, like right after they were gonna kick everybody out. So a lot of people that coming that were coming into the hubs were like, we don't know what we're doing. Like we just got the notice that we have to be out by X state. Um it was it was really hard being a, like talking to those people. I think once coming back home, I very grateful to have everything that I have. I look back and I'm like, I complained about this. Right. Um really humbly. You it, it's unexplainable yeah yeah yeah, yeah I, I i don't feel like i have a whole lot more to add on this but it yeah there's just so many human like humans we came in contact with that just had such powerful stories and messages and like yeah uh just like connecting with them you pick up all these little nuances of like what the local situation is and that was that was just yeah uh, really powerful to like understand how they're all like how they're being screwed over how and how the 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 way we show up is puts a smile on their face and that is that, that's huge uh, especially when everything around them is so miserable and hard 
So yeah, there's uh like a security guard by like that uh was going around our res uh our resort and it was like the last night and I, I connected with him briefly and Rob had already connected with oh, him yeah. and <laughs> but, um, he, like he drove like two hours from like two hours away every single day. Um and it was his story was just really tough um and so cool to hear and then at the end of it he was just like you guys got to come back like really appreciate how you guys showed up and how like the, like how you guys interacted with the community and it was just like even the security guard was noticing and appreciating us and yeah it you should. yeah i don't think one person that we like helped was ungrateful for us being there like i know like we were kind of anticipating that reaction where it was like oh like oh my gosh, you know, like, why are you guys even here? Like, you don't even know, like, what's going on. But, like, I, I swear, like, I mean, every single person that we helped was, like, so thankful of us being there. And that's, like, more than enough, you know? Just even that is more than enough. Yeah. I think also we forget that any one of us can be put into that situation at any moment. And so, like, I think that's another big part of, like, that connection is, like, someone you know, while there's a lot of tension and like background information with like what happened and what continues to happen in that area and how people of Hawaii are affected. Um, I think, you know, we see here in the fires in California, any one of us, you know, could lose our home. And it that that just happened to happen to a lot of people over there. And so I think that's part of like the connection is that like, these are just people who are living their lives and um and that's just what all of us are doing is just trying to live our lives and maybe get some joy out of it and um sometimes stuff happens and you have to show up for each other because otherwise like you know wasn't that what we want for them to do for us if we're in that situation yeah I, I will add that like I like I have been homeless before yeah like it's um it's like definitely something I've dealt with and like you can just see it in people's eyes like you know you can see like the despair and like the tough times that they know they're they're going to be facing or they're already facing like it, it's it's very apparent you know it's not something and like like over here in my experience it's very hard to find those kind of like outreach and like services to be provided for you like that you know that you need you know, a place to get food, a place to get clean water, a place where you can like get toiletries and things like that, or even just like be around a community of people that like understand what you're going through. So like having the opportunity to do that and help there and having these like setups where we can actually have like an impact is huge. So monumentally huge to these people because they could just, you know, they could just not have help. You know, they could, they could just be there. They could have no hub. They could have no volunteers there and they could just be on their own. That That's totally an option. And instead, like people act and it shows us that like we can do something about that. Like we don't just have to stand idle and do nothing when mm -hmm. like we can help the person next to us that needs it. I think I think one thing that helps uh, uh, allow for. So just the, the folks, the fact that these folks are there and being authentic, that's the most important thing. Like. But that that's that's how you can have those interactions and stuff. But another thing that I think we can help support at an institutional level is, um, and I've seen the difference in various contexts over the years. Um, uh, there, there's a uh, you know the idea of parachuting in has become a popular criticism of late about um, disaster recovery and science and other locations and things of that nature. Um, and, and for completely valid reasons, what we do is not parachuting in. And it's, I think it becomes very clear. So having these long-term relationships with these communities makes a huge difference. And so you heard these guys say it, all of our 100% of our partners have said this to me, which is, okay, so you come back in the summer or next time when you come back, we need you to, and then like, you know, fill in the bike. We want you to, you know, da -da 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 -da. and so they don't, they expect us to to i mean they're not demanding it's not, not not like that but 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 they see that we have a genuine interest and having that long-term commitment and not being a, a a 
sort of one-off type of thing is one of the reasons why some people will open up. So I, I've definitely seen it experiences where um, people are hesitant to to share a story or or experience or whatever, and like they kind of say, "Oh, these guys are just whatever tourists or or alternative spring breakers or whatever the the thing is." And then when they hear about what the students actually do, what we actually do, much more willing to share, much more willing to give and take. And they open up in, in a way that is not possible were we to be, again, very appreciative of anybody showing up and, and, and not, not saying they're, they're a jerk or something, but, but specifically with the deeper personal stories and narratives, that takes some honesty and some skin in the game and, and realizing that we are committed for a long term and not on a one off um, makes it uh, doesn't guarantee those experiences, but makes those experiences more likely. Um, and again, another institutional challenge. How do we how do we fund these things? Because it also becomes like, well, you know, we want to spread it out. Right. Well, why, why should the Maui trip go every single year or the New Orleans trip? Like, like I get that. That seems um and that's a, that's a fair criticism, but but one of our strengths is having these long term relationships. And so so administratively, we need to figure out how we can more longitudinally support these types of uh, experiences. Cool. Any other or people online have any questions that haven't asked anything yet? Sounds like no. <laughs> Okay, uh, any other last uh, questions people had in here? Oh, sorry, somebody has a chat. No questions, just thank you. Oh, okay, cool, yeah, thanks, Kendall. Well, thanks to y'all for being here. Yeah. 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 I mean, I know you said thanks to us, but uh, yeah, it's early, y'all didn't have to show up. But <laughs> we appreciate you being here and hearing us out, thanks. All right, cool, I, th I think I'll, I'll kill the Zoom, but we can hang out and chat for a bit, but thanks for everybody joining uh, remotely, and um, we'll we'll post this some way, shape, or form so people that weren't able to he be here could, could uh, have it. So thanks for attending, everybody. Talk to you guys soon. Good.